Okay, we are continuing with our sermon series. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. So today we're going to talk about knowing God and, and see that it is a true and genuine relationship. Some, some people, when they think about God and church, and they just they don't see it as having a relationship with someone who loves them, and, and, and how can this be a direct relationship? Because people just, if they've not been in touch with it before, if they've never had an experience where, they, where God has spoken to them or where they have called out to God, they, they can't grasp sometimes that it is a genuine relationship. And it's, it's a relationship very familiar to us, just like we would have with another person. So we're going to look at that today. It's knowing God is a genuine relationship. Just remind us of our goals for the sermon uh, series as we're deepening our understanding of God and also deepening our relationship with Him. If we already have Jesus Christ living in our heart, if we already serve a living God, we can have a closer relationship with Him. All right, we're going to begin today with uh, reading from Psalms chapter 91. And uh, I... I have my scripture here, I have my Bible, I could read it direct from there, but I go ahead and I choose to go ahead and put it up on the screen since not everyone reads from the same translation. But we're rereading from the New Revised Standard Version today. Psalms chapter 91 and all 16 verses of the chapter. Reads this way. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress my God, in whom I will trust. For He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks at darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, no scourge shall come near your tent. For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And on their hands... They will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life I will satisfy them. Show them my salvation. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promise, Lord. As we look at this scripture today, Lord, let it become alive in our hearts. We praise you in Jesus' name. We're talking about relationship with God, and it's a genuine and true relationship. And I want to look at this passage closer, and let's just see what, you know, how is God making a relationship with us in everything that we do? And everything that we and everything that he does, how does he draw himself closer to us and make those make those commitments to us? So there's a word in the English language that we don't use too often these days, but I thought it was appropriate to to give us a definition of it. And the, and the word is to court. To court. People uh, who are my age would know what it means to court someone, but younger people don't don't not, are familiar with this word, this concept very much. So I looked it up, um, Merriam-Webster.com, and here's the definitions. There's a lot of definitions for the word court. Of course, you know, if you get a traffic ticket, you're going to go to court. We're not talking about that kind of court. We're talking about the verb to court. And the definitions that apply here, that we're going to talk about, is uh, 2 and 3. And uh, 2a, to seek the affections of, 
especially to seek to win a pledge of marriage from. That's what we're talking about today. Most people, when they think of, when they hear the word courting, though, they think of that in the animal sense. The, the, the biologists adopted the term from the English language to describe when two animals are deciding, you know, who to, you know, which other animal would be the right one to mate with. So the second definition, to perform actions to, in order to attract for mating, you know, to animal courtship. You see, you know, pe peacocks that will spread their feathers mm -hmm. or horned animals like antelopes or something that will, two males will fight each other for the affections of the, of the female, you know, that sort of thing. So people are familiar with the word, young people, in that sense of the word. They've heard it in school or they've watched, you know, National Geographic. Who, what kid watches National Geographic? But if they flip past it, they probably have seen something like that. And courting, you know, they think, oh, well, this is the animal from the animal kingdom. But this was a word that described human relationships and two people who were falling in love and who wanted to see more of each other and maybe consider the possibility to marriage. Definition 3A, to seek to attract by, by solicitation, attention, or offers of advantages. So those of us who are older and remember what courting was, or maybe, maybe uh, to uh, remember our parents talking about it or our grandparents, you know, a young man who might want the attentions of a young lady and might want to, you know, spend a little bit more time with her, probably went to her father and said, you know, I'd like to have your permission to begin to, you know, date your daughter. Today we think about, oh, the only time you go meet the parents is when the decision's practically made and and you're going to go ask the father, you know, I want to marry your daughter. But this, this is, we're talking old school here. This is to court someone. Is you're going to spend time first getting to know the young lady. And so you go to the dad and ask permission. Now it was a little bit, you know, antiquated maybe when uh, Sheila and I were getting married. But I remember a, uh, a marathon trip that she and I made to South Carolina where her father was staying at the time with his uncle. And uh, it was a whirlwind tour. We left after work on a Friday, and then we were back to work for Monday morning to go back to work. But in that period of time, we managed to drive all the way there and and uh, basically ask ask Dad, "Hey, Dad, I, I'd like to you know like to court your daughter." It was basically basically that type of a situation. We were going to to go ask Dad's permission. And we often talked about, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in the pro, I'm courting, I'm courting Sheila. You remember that? That's been a long time ago, has it? Courting you proper. I'm courting you proper. That's exactly the courting way we That's right. If you're going to do it, do it right. You've got to court her proper. proper. Yeah, I'm sure Sheila would remember that. Got to be courting proper. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to continue to court your wife after she becomes your wife. You, That's right. After you get married, it doesn't hurt to continue courting. All the women would say, Amen. Val <laughs> Guys, Valentine's Day is coming up. We should remember. We should remember our responsibilities. Do some courting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, praise you, Lord. Yeah. I thought you might have noticed that. Okay. Court and proper. So young people remember this and might think it's silly, but it is a form of respect. You're not only showing respect to the to the parents, but you're also showing respect to the young lady that you know you're going to love her family in the long haul. So this is you know, I mean there's some importance to it here. And of course the family, you know everyone should be in agreement. There's no it's not a good thing to start out a relationship with a wife and be at odds with family. Right. So so this this is a, this is a very this is. A, an action of wisdom. And it does apply to human relationships, not to just the animal kingdom. So ask yourself this question. Ask yourself this question. When you're seeking a partner as, for a long-term relationship, what types of commitments do you look for and which do you offer to give? When you're seeking a partner for a long-term relationship, 
What types of commitments do you look for? And which do you offer to give? Some people would maybe list things like this that they're looking for from their potential partner. You know, when I get together with my significant other, I want to feel safe. I need to have the security to know that everything's going to be okay. And they look for that when they look for a mate. They want someone who will be faithful to them. It's always wonderful to hear, you know, I want to make your dreams come true. To hear that come from another human being. Someone that you love and you long to be with. To hear them say, I'm committed to see your dreams come to pass and to build your dreams. Some good songs about that. Maybe you're from, you know, the other persuasion. Maybe this is maybe this is the lady talking here on the rep on the left, and maybe it's the guy that we're talking about next. As a guy, I I, I desire to, to be loved and to have devotion from my wife. It's always good to hear that the person that you're going to marry or that you are married to has faith in you. They believe in you. They believe in what you do, and they believe in how you how, how you how you think and how you serve and they have faith in what you're doing it's always great to hear your partner brag about you oh just you know maybe how what a good thing that you do and things that you don't even think about maybe they've noticed and they're telling other people about it and how they're just proud of you I mean that's that's always good and that's sometimes what we look for in a relationship and gives us that certainty to know but above all, we want to be able to trust another person. We want to be able to trust them. When we're not around, how, how are they going to behave? You know, are they, do they mean what they say? Are they going to carry out and do those things? When we're looking for a long-term relationship, these are the types of things that are commitments that we make to one another. And if we're serious about a relationship, this is what we're willing to give. This is what we're willing to offer to the other person. To be for them what they need and for them to be for us what we need. Young people don't think about these things, but in long-term relationships, these are the things that make it last. These are the things that make it good. And these are the same kinds of things that God offers to us when we go to Him. Let me see. Let's, let's go over this uh, Scripture in Psalm and we're, we're going to begin to see this. God gives us good reasons to trust Him. Now, how do we know we can trust God? Well, people that already have a relationship, listen to what they say. Listen to the things that they say. And those that have been with the Lord for a long time, they've been on the long haul with Him, they've gone through experiences in life, and, and God has gone through those experiences with them. Listen to the things that they have to say. Listen to this. Read the first two verses here. This is again from Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress and my God in whom I trust. What's the Scripture say? People who live under God's protective covering openly declare their faith in Him. Ask someone who's been a Christian for a long time. Well, that's going to get on my nerves. Ask someone who's been a Christian for a long time. And they will tell about God. And they'll tell how, you know, through those difficult times in life, I didn't know I was going to make it through, but God carried me through. And they're talking about that relationship with Him. Now, who initiates that relationship? God initiates that relationship. We love God because He first loved us. He was looking for us when we weren't looking for Him. When we were lost, He came and found us. And people who've been Christians for a long time will declare and confess, I have faith in Him because I can trust Him. And if you don't know God as, as the Lord of your life, if you don't know Him and have a relationship with Him, know 
from a person who's been a Christian for a long time, you can trust Him. The things that He says are true. I declare that I have faith in the living God. He will not lie. God is one who cannot lie. We can have faith and trust in Him. Verse 3, For He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. This world is full of trappings and there's, there's so many things that can infect us. And you can think of you know, real diseases and, and communicable things that can, can make our bodies sick, but it's also of the Spirit. Things go around. Turn on your television and you see those things flowing through that can infect you. There's all kinds of trappings in this world. And trappings and diseases are no match for God, though. Because He will deliver you from them. If you need to be delivered from them, God will rescue you. Sometimes that begins by figuring out that we are in a trap. Sometimes that begins by figuring out this thing that I'm taking in is not good for me. But when we need deliverance and we call out to God, He will deliver us. He will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and deadly pestilence. It says He will cover you with His pinions. And that's just the part of the wing of a bird that is out towards the end. It says He will cover you with His pinions. And under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. What's that mean? God's faithful covering is gentle like a bird's wing covering her chicks, but it's mighty like soldiers' weapons. Shield and a buckler are weapons of war in those days. If you were going to go fight an enemy, you needed to have some defensive protection. And this is exactly what God gives us. When He covers us with His wings, when we find a place near God and we're in the secret place of the Most High, we are under His protective covering. Think about those relationships that we have. What do the ladies typically want is, is safety and security. They need that protection that their husband gives. But we as children of God need God's protection. And God offers that. He's in it for the long haul. He wants to have those long-term relationships with us. You know, even Jesus made reference to this sort of thing. We hear what he says in uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Calling out, crying, lamenting over Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem, how long have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing? God seeks and desires to have that relationship. He just wants to wrap his arms around us and have that relationship. He desires that. Just like a man desires to wrap his arms around a young lady or a young lady around a man, God desires to wrap his arms around us. He wants to protect us. He wants to be our covering and our protection. And are we going to be willing? Are we willing to allow him to do that? Relationships. It says, You will not fear the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day. Or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. What the scripture means, you will not fear the dangers that strike with force in the daytime or sneak up at night while you're at rest. When we have a relationship with God, God watches us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No interruptions in service, no false positives. They don't send the cops at night when you oops, strip the alarm or whatever. God is always watching over us. Whether it's during the day, whether it's at night, God is ever present. He is ever present. He gives us good reasons to trust Him. Let's look at one more. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. So when we're with God, we are in a place of complete safety. When we're under those wings, when we're under His protective covering, and we trust in Him, things that pull other people down to the depths 
do not come near us. And you'll witness with your own eyes the fate that befalls thousands around you. When other people are, are struggling, when other people aren't making it, they're not, God will provide a way. God will provide a means for, to carry you through. We think of stories like Noah's Ark. When the rest of the world was being flooded out, when the rest of the world was drowning in their own sin, and the water was rising up over them, God carried Noah out above and beyond. And there's stories after stories after stories in the Old Testament that talk about that. Whether we're in the Old Testament or whether we're in the New, God provides that safety. It's part of His commitment to us. It's part of His love for us and His desire for relationship. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge will come near your tent. It's because you have put your trust in God that you're protected from evil. We're not talking about random chance. We're not talking about luck of the draw. We're not talking about, oh, you were pretty smart and you saw the... You know, the rain coming and you, you stepped out of the way. This is God watching out for us when we aren't seeing it coming. God has His protection. And it's because we put His trust in Him that we have this protection. It's not for any other reason. Sometimes we can go through life and we can ride along just fine for a little while. We, we can make it and we think we're doing fine, but then something devastating happens and things in life do come. But if I'm going to walk through tragedy in my life, I'd rather have the Lord with me because He's watching out for me when other things could sneak up. He's watching my back. He's got me covered. It's because we put our trust in Him that we are protected from evil. But you ask yourself one other question. Ask yourself this question. How far would you go and what would you sacrifice to ensure the safety of and security and the happiness of those that are closest to you. How far would you go and what would you sacrifice to ensure the safety and security and happiness of those closest to you? Husbands, this is a question. How would you protect your wife and the rest of your family? And for the mothers, this is more likely, how would you protect your children? But what would you go? What sacrifices would you make? Just this week, you know, I heard it come out of a man's mouth. He would die for his family. What would we sacrifice? What would we do? So in Psalms 91, you know, besides the reason God gives to say that we can trust in Him, is He also describes some of the actions that He takes. He has resources at His disposal beyond what we could even know, and He will utilize those resources to see that we are cared for, to see that our financial needs are met. We go through tough times. David said in the Old Testament, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That is to say, God would bankrupt heaven before He would allow us to go completely under without His protection. He is always going to be there. Through lean times, He's going to be there. He will never let us go completely without. And this is, this is the best word really, that really describes us that I have found is affirmative action. We think of that term as having some special meaning, and if you're talking about hiring, of course that has a meaning, but affirmative action means that you're, you're performing some extra action to lift someone up who needs to be lifted up. And that's exactly how we are with God. So call this little part God taking affirmative action. It says, For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. See, God has angels at His disposal. His servants created before mankind was even created. And these angels are a little higher than we are. Scripture says we are a little lower than the angels. So from our point of view, they are powerful beings. And God commands them and dispatches them to guard and protect you 
in everything you do if you are a servant of Him. It says, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Another scripture, Psalms chapter 34, verse 7. It says, The angel of the Lord encamps around them who fear, who fear Him and delivers them. If the Lord is living in your heart today, if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, somewhere that in a place that you cannot see, there's an angel there that's got, got his camping gear out. He's on, a, he's on a, a little safari, a little expedition, a little camping trip. Outside your front yard or in your backyard, Wherever is close to your home that He needs to be, God plants an angel there. This is Scripture. And that angel is there for one reason only, to guard and protect you. So we don't have to fear the devil. We don't have to fear the things that could come in and harm because God is watching over us. Can bad things happen? Yes. Is God with us? Yes. Is His angels there? Yes. Trust in the Lord. On their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Now, I personally relate to this kind of scripture because I'm pretty clumsy. And this is, just, <laughs> this is um, you know, I, I, I make mistakes. I do uh, pretty stupid things sometimes. It's not just exterior forces that coming against us that can cause cause us harm. Some of sometimes our own pains are caused by our own um, uh, well silly mistakes, and I make plenty of them. But angels are there for that too. When you make mistakes and fall, the presence of angels deters the harmful results. Fall, yeah, walking around barefoot out in the rocky yard and stub your toe on a rock, yeah, it can happen. But you know, aren't you glad that you didn't gash your foot open? Or if you gashed your foot open, aren't you glad you didn't have an infection to set in? Aren't you glad there was somebody nearby that was in shouting distance? These are the kind of things that angels help to be responsible for. Sometimes we can do some really dumb things. I took a, a truck out one time to go get some gravel. It was a truck that was borrowed. And it wasn't really in uh, proper working order. <laughs> But I drove up to the uh, rock quarry to get my uh, get my gravel, and you know I didn't just get a little. I mean I had a truck, so I had to get a lot. And this is an absolutely true story. I drove that truck home, and something just wasn't right about it. I could tell, but you know I had to get my gravel there. I had people come and pour concrete or whatever. I had to I had some things I had to get done. So I'm driving home. I've got this pickup truck, and to uh, to uh, back it up in the yard. Basically, I got to the front of the yard and I turned the wheel to the left and my plan was to put it in reverse and then back right in. And I drove this thing like 15 miles to get it home. And I got right in front of the house and I turned the wheel just in the right direction to get to back up into the yard and at just that moment, boom, you just take it and spin it like that and the wheel would would go and completely detached. And, you know, I, I put it in reverse and I backed right into the spot where I needed to be. And I and and if and if it if I had been able to turn my wheel, if it had stopped a second too soon, I wouldn't have been able to pull it in there. Who knows what would have happened carrying around probably a ton of gravel in the back of this truck if that had happened going on the road at 40 miles an hour. And I didn't make a turn or something. Now, you know, the question I've got is how long has that been actually detached from the vehicle? Um, <laughs> you know, I have no doubt that underneath the hood of that vehicle, in between the steering column and the assembly underneath, there was some angel going, boy, I hope he gets home soon and holding that thing together. I have no doubt in my mind. I have no doubt in my mind that angel was watching out for me that day. <laughs> you know, if, it, if he had to hold on to the axle, he'd have been spinning around under there, whatever he had to do. But, you know, the steering column, you do this. And so I know there was this angel under there doing this. 
And he was probably very relieved when we got home. <laughs> and I kid you not, I get up under this truck and I, I look at it because I borrowed it and I'm supposed to get it back home. And I look up under there and there's the two parts where they connect. There were supposed to be four bolts. There wasn't a single bolt holding them. I didn't see a bolt anywhere on the ground. You know. <laughs> That was that was really scary when I got home and I, I got to that spot and it went, you know, and I could sit there and angels watching out for us when we do dumb things. <laughs> dumb things. I am thankful for that. And I have no doubt that that was an angel watching watching. How long, how long those parts had become detached and were not drivable in the real world. In the you know in the what we consider to be the real world, I mean you can't drive if the things are not connected and attached. And yet I made it home. God was watching out for me that day. He takes affirmative action, lifting people up who don't really know better, who who need a little bit of boost to get them through. God really helped me that day. It says, you will tread on the lion and the adder and the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. You know, we don't have to deal with lions and these things so much these days. Adders, deadly snakes, of course we've got some around here, but not so much. We don't think about this, it's hard to relate. We live near the Smoky Mountains, sometimes we get some black bears in the backyard or something, but... We don't think about having to deal with this. But what's this verse mean when you boil it down? It says, through God's protection and influence, we will have victory over powerful enemies and deadly situations. And we face deadly situations today, whether it's out on the road with all these crazy drivers, people driving around with angels up under their hood, uh, or whether it's we, you know, we're dealing with the violence of this age, road rage and everything else that can happen, powerful enemies and deadly situations. God goes with us and He will make us have victory in our life. Can we have bad situations happen? Yes. Can we come down the ladder quite a way? Yeah. But God is with us. Wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we face, God is with us. And, and if we trust Him, He will give us the victory. Those who love me, He says, I will deliver. And I will protect those who know my name. What's important about knowing God's name is knowing who to go to when bad things happen. It's knowing who to go to when we need help. When we face a situation that we can't deal with, We call on God's name. And God takes deliberate steps to defend people who love Him and call on His name. You know, when we call out to God, when we finally see the situation that's facing us, when we finally see the danger, and we finally see the thing that maybe is going to try and topple us over and do us harm, and we call out, God, please help me. You know, God has already been at work bringing the aid to you that you need. I, I gave an example a little while ago. You know, you step on a nail or cut your foot open or something. Maybe you're out by yourself and you say, God, help me. And whatever the situation might be, help is just around the corner. You know, maybe, maybe there's some people who are just passing through, hiking out in the woods or whatever, and all of a sudden, well, here these strangers are that are going to help you. You know, if God sent them, He had to have sent them long before you cut your foot open, long before you cried out. And that's what we mean when we say God lives not just in this moment, but He is in the moments to come. He, when we call out to Him up in the future, He's already back here in the past sending the help that we need. He is already working things out. I, God takes deliberate steps to defend people who love Him. And when we call on His name, He has already been at work bringing those things to pass. It's an affirmative action. It's the best word I can think of. It says, When they call to Me, I will answer them, and I will be with them in trouble, and I will rescue them and honor them. 
When someone calls on God, God leaps into action. Really, it's true to say God has already leapt into action. But His response is always the same. He is there to rescue from danger and also to shower you with honor. When we go through situations, sometimes we think it's, you know, why am I here? But in the end, there's usually a reason we find why we went through a certain situation. Heroes are made in the moment that they take they do heroic action. But how do they do heroic action? What puts them in that situation? There's imminent danger. If someone is being a hero, it's hard to be a hero unless you're in the midst of that danger as well. So when we go through things and God rescues us, if we're a Christian, He is also working to honor us. If we pray to Him in secret, Scripture says He will reward us openly. And this is exactly the kind of thing that we would expect. One more verse, verse 16. It says, With long life I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. The expectation that Christians have, the servants of God, our expectation is long life on earth and eternal life afterwards. With long life I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. When we serve God, when we, when we make that decision in our life that we're going to serve Him, that we're going to follow His ways, that we're going to make the examples that Jesus gives be the roadmap for our life, God rescues us, He honors us, but He gives us this expectation that we can live long with Him and that in the end, whenever our time to come on this earth ends, we have a long, even much longer life to expect with Him, eternal life. So what is the most significant action that God has taken? What, what's this affirmative action He's done to build us up, to, to lift us up from lower places to higher places with Him? The most significant action that He's taken What's He done to ensure the safety, security, and happiness of those who are closest to Him? He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. When we were deserving of punishment, when we were deserving of the judgment that He's obliged to give, and He's the unwilling judge, He sent His own Son to take our punishment and to die in our place. And if that were the end of the story, that would be a great thing that He had done. But the story doesn't end there. Because He raised Jesus from the dead. He promised to do it, and He did it. And what that promise means to us is that He will raise us also. We can expect... We should live in the expectation of long life on earth. But after the end, because He raised Jesus up, He'll raise us up as well to eternal life. Will you begin that relationship with Him today? God has done so much to have a committed relationship with you. God has done so much to demonstrate that He wants to have this long-term relationship with us. And He's asking Will you come and be mine? Will you come and let me wrap my arms around you? Let me cover you? Will you let me dispatch my angels to protect you? Will you let me rescue you from danger? Will you allow me to honor you? Like a man seeking the affections of a woman, God seeks the affections of us. He, he seeks to be with us. He seeks to provide all those things that we look for. When we look for things in a long-term relationship, the things that we need, God wants to provide them. Will you begin that relationship with Him today? If you desire to do that, pray, pray a prayer like this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask, Father, that You would 
forgive me of my sins. Lord, I draw close to You. Help me to be clean. But Father, above all else, I believe that You raised Jesus from the dead. And I make Him the Lord of my life. I want to serve Him and follow after Him and learn His ways and follow His examples. And so I make Him the Lord of my life. And I tell it openly and I tell others that Jesus is Lord. Thank You for saving me. And thank You for wanting to have a relationship with me. In Jesus' name. You pray a prayer like that and God will begin that relationship with you. Sermon today, Knowing God is a Genuine Relationship. If you have any comments or questions, please send them to me. Send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Spakes at spiritandtruth.net Thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus,